yeah, this this next this first slide sort of crosses over between the presentation this morning and Nicola's uh, introduction earlier. Um, as I'm sure, as you all know, the the snappily titled titled Government Expert Working Group on Football Supporter Ownership and Engagement uh, paper was reported on early in 2016, and it recommended structured dialogue between clubs and supporters and supporters groups. Um, now the they have to have these structured dialogue meetings twice a year to discuss major issues. Um, and I just sort of had a thought about some of the issues are probably more long-term strategic issues. Um, things like uh, match day travel, finances that, that Nick has gone over, um, fixture scheduling, um, how that affects fans. Um, obviously there's ticket costs and away, away tickets. Uh, there was the 20 years plenty campaign, which was really successful. Um, and there is a, a push to sort of have structured dialogue meetings formally in the rules of the Premier League, of the Football League. And I think Nicola is working with lower leagues to, to sort of get it more formally into the actual regulations of those uh, league clubs throughout the, the Football League pyramid. Um, so I don't want to go over what, what was done this morning and with Nicola's um, introduction, but this part of the presentation is really about how to prepare for those meetings, um, what sort of issues to think about, and also the confidentiality elements of those meetings and, and how that should be approached. Um, I've approached this from a sort of a more small focus type meeting, not a fan forum, because if you have a huge fan forum, the chances of confidentiality happening are, are, are nil. I mean, if you have something like the Portsmouth um, fan forum which occurred a few months ago that was broadcast on BBC radio on the internet and um, I had a listen it was actually really interesting but the chances of keeping something obviously if it wasn't broadcast on the internet but keeping something behind closed doors with about a thousand people there is just it's just not going to happen and um, so this is more an approach from a club and fan point of view of a, a small focused group um, that would that would meet with the club um, so, as Nicola discussed earlier, the attendees should be the elected and nominated representatives of the Supporters Trust. Um, it would be a good idea to create an agenda for this type of meeting. It, it, it sets the tone, um, it sets out what's to be discussed, um, it allows both sides to prepare answers and questions for, for what's coming up. Um, and also, it allows you to prepare certain documents for that type of meeting. So. As you saw in a few slides before, we've dealt with some land issues or who owns a stadium or who actually owns a, the pitch that the team play on. If, that would be, if that's what the meeting is going to, going to be about, then you can engage with professional advisors like surveyors or um, property specialists to get your house in order before you actually um, approach the meeting. Um, in regard to sensitive information and confidentiality, um, I have put up there about non-disclosure agreements. There, a non-disclosure agreement or NDA, or is the same thing as a confidentiality agreement. NDA is more of a maybe an American term. Um, now it's not always necessary, but it can go one of two ways. It, it shows that you mean business. Um, if you walk in there with an NDA for you to sign and for the other side to sign, it shows that professionalism and it shows that you mean business in regard to what you're about to discuss. On the flip side, it might also put people's back up straight away if you go in there with a demand of this is what's going to be confidential, this what not. If you imagine it's going to be a more of a friendly kind of chat, then a, an NDA may not be strictly necessary um, or appropriate. Um, one other way that people might think, might think to make things confidential is to mark certain documents or emails or correspondence as confidential. But that can actually be troublesome and, and quite admin heavy then because then what happens if you don't randomly mark one thing confidential then all of a sudden that piece of information is not confidential compared with with everything else um so it, whether you as a trust or the elective representatives that go into a meeting whether you sign up to an nda or not the, the basic elements of an nda or confidentiality agreement are good to to follow in that type of meeting. Um, so these kind of things would be defined within an actual formal confidentiality agreement, but again, if you don't sign one, it, it 
it's it's good to think about before you enter into a meeting for, for both sides. So, so what actually is confidential information? Um, I mean, you need to define the parameters of what is confidential and what's not. Um, are financial reports confidential? Are the actual meetings themselves or the, the fact that the meeting is occurring, you can actually make that confidential in itself. Um, what about any results of the meeting, any conclusion? Um, are those also confidential? These are things that you can think about defining beforehand um, or if in an agreement, define it itself. Um, if a meeting is for a particular project or purpose, perhaps uh, a new stadium build or a new land to build training ground on, something like that, is, is that in itself confidential? So you're keeping things really tight. Um, also, who can use this information? Is it just the people in the room? Or can it be divulged to your consultants, their employees? Um, how far down the line does this information need to go? And again, that will really depend on your relationship between the trust and the club. Is it friendly? I know some trusts get on the club, some trusts don't. Um, is it, can it be used by all employees within the club to, to achieve that purpose that you've, you've outlined at, at the start of the meeting or in the agenda? I mean, it's something to really think about before um, getting into the, the nitty gritty in the meeting. And, and what type of use, I mean, can you make copies of it? If this is particularly sensitive financial information, you might want guarantees as to be how it will be stored, um, whether it be secure. Uh, I mean, we've seen a lot recently about hackers. Um, could this sensitive information about you, your trust, the club or its finances, could it be hacked or, or released somehow? Um, I think there was football, footy leaks or football leaks, which has managed to get its hands on certain football contracts and, and information to, to leak through Twitter. And um, we wouldn't want that to happen. And then the other question is, when does confidential information cease to become confidential? Um, we spoke just in regard to finance, um, that if something's going to be released on Companies House anyway, that will be in the public domain. So it, it, that is information which has begun its life as perhaps confidential in the audit and, and the books that they've looked at and the financial information. But then once released onto Companies House, it's not confidential anymore. Um, so anything that's in the public domain is not confidential. And the easiest way to find if something's in the public domain is simply Google. Um, before I did the presentation today, I, we obviously, a lot of the work that we do is for trusts is confidential, but if the subject matter of that is on the internet, that's in the public domain. And therefore the fact that um, a club has a certain issue with an owner or something like that, it's it's in the public domain, it's, it's not confidential anymore. Um, another way is if it's lawfully received, um, you can approve or mark it as confidential. So something that is received by you as, as confidential, the parties can agree in a meeting, look, this is okay to release. Um, you could sign a sort of a, a form to, to say that, that this is now able to be released in the public. Um, if you happen to randomly develop some information or gain it independently yourself, that would then not be regarded as confidential information. Um, and then one that rarely happens, but if, if a court or if there's some sort of other court or court case or regulation that demands the release of certain information, um, if a club is asked to do that, it must release that information, even if it is confidential. Uh, you can usually, they can usually sort of release as little as possible. But if a court asks them to do it, they, they have to do it. Um, I think it's gone to the one place. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. One, yeah. Um, so how long is that kind of information confidential? I mean, you can, in confidentiality agreements, you can specify a time period. You can say these, uh, the terms of this agreement will last for two years, after which whatever is discussed is then out in the open, you're willing to discuss. The, the way we usually draft our agreements is not to be as, as a, as precise as that because who knows what could be discussed or what came up what can come up and all of a sudden two years later it's open it's open season and whatever was talked about so we usually draft these in a way that confidential information will stay confidential forever until it becomes unconfidential by one of the the reasons i just outlined by coming into the public domain by court um 
by being developed, something like that. Um, now, remedies for breach is, is really in regard to a, an actual confidentiality agreement that's been entered into. Um, one of the problems of remedies for breach is if, if someone does breach a confidentiality agreement and, and information's out there that shouldn't have got out there, the cat's out of the bag. It's tough. It's a bit. It's a bit hard to for clubs to deal with. But um, the clubs can, for example, injunct a fan uh, and prevent them from releasing more information or um, gaining more information to release. But I think that would be incredibly unlikely because uh, simply because of PR reasons. I mean, clubs big or small, Premier League or lower leagues, don't want to be seen to be pursuing individual fans over over minor matters. Um, and just sort of in, in conclusion, I mean, the, these are all things to, to think about before a meeting, whether the, you put them in a formal agreement or not. It, it, it's good guidance as to, to how to control information before you meet with people. And uh, if you... If you do that, it focuses the minds of everyone before the meeting and it should produce um, a more focused and better result for both the club and the trust going forward with structured dialogue meetings.